Good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship this Sunday morning, May 16th. It's good to be together here at Redmond Presbyterian Church. We are glad that you are with us and that you're logged on. Uh, please feel free to say hello in the chat bar there on the side of the screen or to, uh, to shoot us an email. You can join us after the service on a Zoom call as we continue to stay uh, connected, continue to be the body of Christ in the church, uh, even in the midst of this pandemic time. I have a few announcements for us this morning, and some of these are kind of what I would call oldies but goodies, some, some ones that you've heard me say in the past, but uh, I want to bring them back. Um, we continue to partner with the, the Food Box program, and that runs out of our fellowship hall on a monthly basis. Um, we have some exciting news that, that moving into the summer and the fall and, and the year ahead, um, we're going to continue partnering with that group and even section off a very uh, small part of our fellowship hall uh, so that they can continue running throughout the year as we know that the need, uh, the food insecurity need will continue in our community uh, long after people return to work and school and, and, and certain levels of, of normalcy again uh, coming up. And so we're grateful that we get to partner with that. Uh, in, in just a, a week or two, you're gonna learn more about that. We'll record a little video and share some of that. I'm, I'm very excited. Uh, it's such a wonderful way for our church to uh, partner with our community and to, to use our, our resources, our building, in, in ways that, that serve the work that God is doing. Uh, so that's an oldie but goodie. We've been doing that pretty much the entire time throughout the pandemic. The other one that, that we've been talking about often is small groups. Uh, and perhaps your small group has taken some time off or perhaps uh, you've forgotten about that idea and, 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 and you're looking for ways to continue connecting, especially with the weather getting nicer. Uh, there's lots of opportunities for groups to gather uh, in parks, socially distanced or in people's backyards, uh, spread out, things like that. Um, if you are in a group, great. I hope, hope you guys are continuing to connect and pray for one another. If you're not and would like to be, please feel free to shoot me an email and, uh, and let me know. We'd love to find ways to, to help you connect and to con continue growing in this time. Today is the 16th, and so what that means is after this service ends at uh, about 11.30, uh, we're going to have a spring cleaning day here at the church today. You need to sign up, which you can do on your weekly email, so that we know how many people will be here and how to keep people socially distant and, and safe. Um, but we'd love for you to come down and join us. There will be yard work to do out, outside. There will be uh, work to do inside, uh, cleaning out closets and, and, and resetting things. Um, and again, if you're able, we'd love to, love to have you come and join us. I think those are the big ones coming up. Youth group continues to meet. They're meeting tonight at 7 o'clock. So uh, students 6th through 12th meeting with Austin Rabine. We hope that, that you're continuing to enjoy that time as well. Okay, friends. There are fun things going on, uh, and we're grateful that we get to be together. This is one of those fun things. And in all of it, we pause and we give thanks to God because we, we know that this space is fundamentally about us encountering God's voice uh, so that we can continue to follow Christ uh, into the world, into our lives, uh, in whatever ways that God is leading. So I invite you to hear this call to worship as we begin. We begin by celebrating the good news. It is not we who chose Christ, but Christ who chose us. We are not here because of our goodness, but because of Christ's grace. We are not here to enlighten ourselves, but to allow Christ to enlighten us. We have not come to be entertained, but to worship, to worship God with heart, soul, mind, and strength. And all of God's people said, Amen.
this moment of confession knowing that you will be met by the enduring love of our Savior. Come knowing you are welcomed always. Great God of heaven and earth, you call us to leave behind our preoccupations and to follow you into the future. Sometimes we find your call challenging. We are comfortable, maybe even complacent in our present. May our confessions be the first step of many toward your grace. May your love overwhelm our visions for our lives so that we see everything through the lens of your will. Sisters and brothers, the good news is the same yesterday, today, and forever. In Christ's great love, we are forgiven and drawn to God's side. Live into this new life today and always. Amen. Well, good morning again, Redmond Presbyterian Church, and welcome, Wilson. Good to see you. Good to see you. Good morning. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I was just chatting with Wilson, and now I'm chatting with all of you out there at RPC. One of the things I have uh, loved during this time when we are, are, are separated, and frankly, when we're together too, uh, but but this gives us the venue to do it, is to to explore the question of, of where do we see God continuing to lead us and, and help us grow and, and stretch us? Uh, because I'm convinced that that even in this time, that's continuing to happen in a, in a myriad of ways. And so I, I've had the privilege of, of getting to chat with Wilson and go for a couple of walks recently and have, have heard you share with me some of the things uh, that, that God is teaching you. And so I would just love it if you'd share with all of us, um, you know, in, in these last months and almost a year plus, um, what are some of those things that you've been learning and, and hearing as, as God's been continuing to, to work in your life? It's a great question. I, I think, you know, that one of the silver linings over the last year that's been really good for, for me and for our family is that um, although we haven't been able to socialize with a lot of people, we've been able to develop a lot of close um, or a lot of good conversations with a few people in ways that maybe we wouldn't have if we, you know, if, if we didn't have the kind of the, the COVID restrictions. So a couple examples is 
um, the, the family, especially with Faith, we've been having a lot of deep discussions as, as she's getting ready to exit high school and go into college about, you know, social topics of the day. And, and her experiences have helped me think about things way differently. Uh, she has a very good friend who's a person of color. And um, just some of what she's experienced because of that, you don't even like it doesn't even show in statistics. Like, for instance, the friend will go into a store and Faith will be with her and she'll she'll wait to make sure she has a receipt because she's been followed out of the store when she, you know, being accused of not buying something. And it's it's and those those things don't come up in statistics. It just happens. And so it's really opened our eyes to see some of that, um, that there's there is there is stuff that happens that are unless you experience it you don't quite understand. And so um, it's been an opportunity for us to have conversation to say, wow, okay, I, I can't walk in those shoes, but I can I can sympathize and maybe empathize indirectly with what that means. And so that's that's one example. And then I've, I've developed a really close friendship with a person at work and um, mm -hmm. we've been able to go on walks and just do a lot of different kind of activities, both in work and away from work that have been really eye-opening to me. He's He's a... He's not a person of faith, but he's kind of searching and he's got a heart for service in terms of the community. So it's it it's we've talked about every I mean, we're very different in a lot of ways, but we there are some things that, you know, if you drew a Venn diagram overlap. So I really appreciated just being able to develop those kinds of friendships and and more deeper relationships through this past year. That's great. You know, listen, I, I think one of the things that a lot of people would would want to know and, and certainly pops up in my head is is not necessarily you know how do I replicate exactly what Wilson is learning but but the question of like when you talk about this this coworker for example who you've built this this friendship with how how does one how do you go how, how have you gone about even beginning that process of of learning and listening I think so many of us are struck by the that that feels like a really a big hill to climb, right? Like, I don't know how to engage with people around topics like that, or what's, what do you say? What's the first thing out of your mouth? I'm just curious to know how you have entered into that, that relationship and that, that posture of learning. It, it's a great question. It sort of grew out organically and that um, he, he started it at my workplace almost three years ago. And a couple years ago, we were, um, it was, I can vividly remember this, we were kind of talking about projects we were working on. And I said, hey, um, you know, do you want to go grab a beer after work? And he says, uh, well, I, I don't drink. I said, oh, okay. Well, let's go to lunch sometime. He said, okay. And then I just thought about, oh, I wonder why he doesn't drink. And so that, and then there were just a lot of little conversations like that about, you know, kind of what his worldview was. And we had, we, we worked on similar projects and we kind of worked together and um, we, there were just little things we talked we talked about the election we talked about growing up we talked about just so there was just little opportunities to ask and he would he would ask me questions too so there was a lot of give and take um and, and he just you know he, it was just kind of a a really good way to develop a relationship with somebody who was not only interesting but interested in in m myself and so um that was kind of one way and then the other way is that that with faith it was she's going through and trying to figuring out her worldview and other things. And it was she'd ask questions or she'd say, well, you know, why did you say things that way? And I, here's my mm -hmm. experience. And so it was these little trigger points that kind of prompted deeper discussions. That's great. I, I love the, the curiosity that, that you demonstrate when, yeah, I, I wonder why he responded that way about going out after work. I wonder, um, I, I think that's such a helpful thing for us to, to all think about because I think it's in those places of curiosity, just as you're describing your own experience that, that God meets us and, and surprises us, right? And so I, I, I really appreciate um, getting to hear that from you and, 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 and appreciate you sharing uh, yeah, those experiences from your life and what you're learning. So thanks so much for uh, sharing that with us this morning. Sure. All right. No problem. Have a great one. We'll talk to you soon. Okay. Thanks. See
every moment I'm awake. Lord, have your way in me. This is my desire to honor. From the book of Matthew, chapter 19, verses 16 through 30. Then someone came to him and said, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which ones? And Jesus said, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother. Also, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, I have kept all these. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, if you wish to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When the young man heard his word, he went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I tell you, it will be hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astounded and said, then who can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals, it is impossible, but for God, all things are possible. Then Peter said in reply, Look, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man is seated on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or fields for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last will be first. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We have just heard Matthew chapter 19 verses 16 through 30 read to us and we're grateful for that. This is the word of the Lord and we say together, thanks be to God. We get to look at this passage today as we continue our sermon series that we're calling Not As We Expected uh, because we want to pay attention to all these places in Matthew's gospel in particular where this call to follow Jesus to be a disciple is, if we're honest, not exactly the way we would draw it up. 
not, not the way we would strategically plan uh, the path forward. We certainly see that in Scripture as Jesus' own disciples encounter these moments of, of confusion. And, and we want to be honest today about, uh, about the ways that we encounter this call to follow Christ and, 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 and we experience moments of feeling like, gosh, that's just different. That's not what I would have expected. And so we want to listen to those places. As we open this passage, as we study this together, I invite you to join me as we begin with a word of prayer. Loving and gracious God, we thank you for your word to us, and we pray that by it we would be a changed and reshaped people, sent out from this place to love and serve and listen and follow in new ways. So we pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together would be pleasing in your sight. It is in your name that we pray. Amen. About this passage, Matthew 9, 16 through 30, that often gets nicknamed the, uh, the story of the rich young ruler or the, the rich, uh, rich man, um, C.S. Lewis once was quoted uh, or remarked on this passage and said, All things are indeed possible with God. This is true. It is even possible to get a, a large camel through the eye of a small needle, but it will be extremely hard on that camel. Helpful words uh, to think about and to, to, to imagine as we encounter this passage because this is a difficult passage for us to sit with and, and to pay attention to. It is a classic, not what we expect kind of moment in scripture where we encounter Jesus having this interaction with this rich young man. And no matter how we try to explain it or what angle we look at it from, these words that Jesus speaks to this man in the passage are, are hard for him, as we can see by his reaction, and they are hard for us today. And that I want to just say before we begin is, is okay for us to recognize that and to know that this work of, uh, of discipleship and following Christ oftentimes is, is challenging in the best ways possible. To set up this passage, just to know where we are, it's, it's helpful to know that immediately prior to his interaction with this rich young man, Jesus has just reminded the disciples that to be blessed in the kingdom of God means to be like a child. He pulls a child out of the crowd after someone says, get the children out of here, and Jesus pulls the child into the center and says, to enter into life with God, you must be like this child. And everyone would have understood what that meant in that day and age, which is that children were dependent and weak. They were small, without power or privilege. Certainly they were beloved and, and, and all that, but they were not included in any meaningful way. And so now, here we are in verse 16, and entering into the picture is someone who, by all accounts, is the complete opposite of that description of what blessedness looks like that Jesus has just laid out. Here comes a man who is wealthy and healthy. He's a man in a society which values all three of those things equally. He's powerful. He's successful. He even is what we would call pious, meaning he's successful even at living an ethical and, and, and religious life. He's followed all of the commandments. He is, in other words, an all-around good guy. And so having succeeded in life and committing himself to being as by-the-book religious as possible, he comes to Jesus unsatisfied. Right? And we know that because he, he, he tells Jesus he needs something more. I've fulfilled all the commandments. What else do I need in order to have eternal life? And he uses that word, and that's important. How do I have eternal life? As if it's one more commodity for him to earn or possess or master. Now, before we're too hard on this overachieving rich young ruler who comes to Jesus, it's worth noting uh, in Mark's gospel, when Mark tells this same story in Mark chapter 10, he says that Jesus looked at this man and loved him. Right? Jesus is not put off by this man's efforts or his striving to be the person that God wants him to be. He looks at him, it says, and loves him. And yet with a very subtle but important change in language, he even invites him to enter 
into life with God. The rich man wants to have this item. He wants to have eternal life. Jesus invites him to enter into this way of living. See the, the very subtle but significant difference there? He does this, I would say, precisely because he loves him. He sees that the issue for this rich young man is not something that he lacks, but rather something that he possesses. Jesus tells the man to sell everything that he has, to give it all, and the money that he makes to the poor. He wants to acquire one more thing, this young man, to add to his vast collection, this thing called eternal life, and instead Jesus tells him to let go, to divest, to offload his possessions. He's asked, in other words, to be more childlike, just like the children that Jesus just lifted up moments ago. And again, if we're honest, we're reminded in this moment that these words are hard, hard for us to hear today. Everything about this rich young man, in my opinion, is familiar to many of us today. He works hard. He tries his best to be a good person. He wants to be the absolute best he can be. In a lot of ways, friends, he looks and sounds just like us. And Jesus looks at him lovingly and says, you're trying to possess something that isn't yours to possess. There are too many things in your way cluttering up your ability to share in the life that God wants you to have. You need to clear the table. Life with God, in other words, isn't something for us to own or to check off on our to-do list, to, to, to lock down or to master or to pretend that we have all figured out. Life with God is to be lived. Often we do lots of interpretive gymnastics with passages like this one to suggest that Jesus doesn't want us to really be poor or to give away our possessions. He's, he's maybe just talking about the condition of our soul or our, our spiritual life as if those things can somehow be so easily separated. But I would agree that this passage isn't, at least initially, in, meant to be a, a universal calling towards voluntary poverty. But I do want to encourage us to be slow to dismiss the notion of examining our wealth and our relationship with power and privilege and our possessions and to pay attention to the role that these things play in our lives and the ways that we treat even Jesus and our faith in similar ways that we treat our possessions. Now, in reality... The shape of this story, I think, gives us a clue as to what Jesus is doing uh, in this passage, both with the rich young man as well as you and I. If we pay attention to the, the shape, the flow of the narrative, the man comes to Jesus in desperation. Again, if we look at Mark's gospel, we see that he comes and falls at Jesus' feet or kneels at Jesus' feet. And after telling him what he needs, Jesus sends him with a command to, to go to go and, and, and do this thing. And so if you just think about the shape of that, someone comes and falls at Jesus' feet, Jesus sends them away. What does that remind you of? What does that look like? If it looks at all or rings familiar, it should. This follows the same pattern that we see throughout the Gospels of a healing story, a healing narrative. In all of the healing narratives, people come to Jesus who are sick, uh, who are possessed, who are coming on behalf of, of a sick or dying loved one, and they fall at Jesus' feet asking for help or healing. And Jesus then declares that they have been healed or the one they love is, has been healed and then calls them to go, right? to go and be washed or to go and return to your loved one or in some cases to go and tell no one about what's happened here. But the pattern is the same. They come to Jesus in desperation, falling at his feet. He sends them away healed to go. This passage with the rich young ruler is likewise a healing story. I think we often mistake it for a teaching about wealth or uh, stewardship or, or giving, but at its root, Jesus is loving this man and wanting him to be healed from his own dependence on power and wealth and his ability to save himself in his life. His wealth and his success 
have shaped his worldview so that he believes that everything is within his own grasp. Right? If he wants to improve in business or in his social life or his family life, all he has to do is look within for the resources that, that he already possesses, that he must muster up to be who he needs to be. If he lacks anything, again, he can turn to his own financial resources to acquire the skills or the knowledge or the property, the thing that he needs. His source for all of his problems comes from within. And yet Jesus makes it clear to him that the source of life that he desires to possess and to own for himself is something outside of his grasp. It is not within, it is by definition without. It's not internal, but it comes to him as a gift of God's grace. Nothing we can do can get us closer to that grace or help us to possess it or control it for ourselves. It is a gift of God's love. And now I know that this might sound like a Sunday school truth that you and I perhaps have heard many times in our lives, but just like the rich young man in this passage, who I suspect has also read the Bible a few times in his life, this is a truth that many of us struggle to fully live into. I know that that's true in my own life. The grace of God is waiting for us to enter into life following Christ loving and serving, working for justice for all people, drawing near uh, to those on the margins. And this is not something that, that we can lay hold of or, or own or check off, again, this lifetime to-do list, right? I think sometimes we want to say, that part of my life, I've got that all figured out. I've resolved that. Everything's good over there. I can turn my attention to something else. Instead, the way of following Jesus is one that continues to unfold as long as we live. So healing in this passage acknowledges, means acknowledging our tendency to want to resolve this notion of faith once and for all, right? To do that thing where we say, yep, I've got it. It's all taken care of. It means acknowledging our tendency to see discipleship to Christ as just a small piece of our life's portfolio. I mean, we we have faith over here and family and work and all these other things. It means acknowledging our tendency to want to construct a life for ourselves that we can stand back and look at and say, yeah, that's pretty good. Right? When Jesus looks at the rich young man and says, there is only one who is good, and that is God. So what is unique in this story about this healing narrative, what is surprising to us or or perhaps important for us to learn from, is that the rich young man doesn't know that he's sick. And frankly, he leaves unhealed. I think like so many of us, he looks at his life and he thinks he's actually doing pretty well. All of the markers that he points to, from his wealth to his following the commandments to his Uh, you know, everything else in life says he's doing well. He doesn't even know that he might need to be healed. About seven or eight years ago, my wife Erica uh, was complaining of uh, pain in her her abdomen, her stomach, and and after it didn't go away for about a day, she went to her, her, her doctor, and after a quick exam, he told her that she had appendicitis and that he had scheduled surgery for the following morning, thinking that she would probably be okay for the next 12 hours or so. So she came home that night and the pain continued to grow. It was a very uh, bumpy night. It it was not easy, but she made it through and and we got her in the car and took her to the hospital in the morning. The nurse, when she saw her check in said, we thought we were going to see you in the middle of the night, assuming that the pain was going to become too bad. And it almost did. So the surgery went well, and and she comes, uh, she gets wheeled back into her room after surgery, and I see her there, and she wakes up uh, in a bit and looks at me from her hospital bed and says, I feel so much better. I had no idea how terrible I'd felt for the last few days. She can say that because she can live with a a great deal of pain. I would never say those words because, frankly, I'm a wimp, but... Those words have always stuck out to me. I had no idea how terrible I felt until now. Perhaps 
this passage is an opportunity for us to see ourselves in the shoes of the rich young ruler and to say to each other and to Christ, I had no idea how sick I was. You see, by every metric from Monday through Friday, and even on Sundays, I thought I had this game of life all figured out. And yet I realize now I was trying to control or possess or acquire something rather than live into this new reality with Christ, to allow this discipleship to be dynamic and changing. Like I said before at the beginning, this passage is hard no matter how we look at it. It might ask us to give up our possessions. It might ask us to let go of our control. It certainly asks us to consider how we are sick when we might even think that we're doing just fine. In this day and age that we all live in, where we all have access to our own private sources of news, where we can curate our own lives exactly the way we want them to be, I wonder if one of the challenges of, the, of this passage is to choose to cultivate curiosity and to let go of our need to possess or to acquire or to master uh, life, knowledge, and faith. Right? So often I hear from people uh, both in personal conversations and in the news, people say things like this certain idea clashes with my own theology or politics or opinions as if all of these things are just static and written in stone and, and, and fully possessed by each one of us. Right? I have my own theology that, that nothing else can touch. I wonder if instead what would happen if we approached our lives as disciples with open-handed curiosity and said things like, I think this is where Jesus wants me to be, but if not, if, if, if somehow Jesus wants me to, to do something else, then certainly let me let go of those things that are holding me back in order to follow Jesus more fully. I think this is what it means for us to follow, to serve, to work for justice in this particular way, but maybe, maybe I need to listen more. Maybe I need to assume that the one who is weak or childlike might have something to say to me, to teach me, and my role is to listen. Maybe I'm sick and I don't even know it. Friends, in all of these places in our lives, as we look into the mirror, as we take stock of, of who we are and where we are, in all of these places, Jesus looks at his disciples and says, if it was left up to you and I, us mortals, it is impossible for any of us to be saved. But for God, all things are possible. What good news is that? With God, all things are possible. And that is truly what we need to hear. These are, in fact, hard words for us to wrestle with. But the good news for us today Sorry, they are also good news for us today. Those of us who are sick and don't know it, for those of us who are desperate and are fully aware of it, for those of us who are convinced that we've got it all right, and for those of us who know that we are completely lost, we know in all of these places there is healing. For in God all things are possible. Amen.
heart with this love Because nothing on earth is as beautiful as you now get to respond to God's word with all of who we are, our lives, our gifts, our financial offerings, our tithes, all of these things. And so uh, we are passing the offering plate and we do that virtually by saying you can click the give now button on our website. It's a very short process if, if you want to do that or you can mail checks into the church and we uh, are grateful for your ongoing support in this time. Uh, as we do the work that God has called us to do in the, in, in the Redmond community. We also bring our prayers, knowing that uh, God invites all of who we are, including our joys and our concerns and our, our, our celebrations and our struggles. And so we do that this morning by uh, sharing our prayers of the people, followed by the Lord's Prayer. If you have prayer requests, there's a number of ways you can share those. You can Jot those in the chat bar there on the side of the screen or email me or, or your deacon directly and we would love to know uh, how we can be praying as a community. Let's go to God now in prayer with one another. Lord Jesus Christ, you tell us not to be afraid of what the future holds, not to worry about tomorrow, but, but that you know how difficult we find it to heed these words. For we worry about so many things, our families, our friends, our circumstances. Some worries are big worries. Most worries are tiny. We come before you this day with these big and tiny worries and with the confidence that comes from you, we know that we can lay them all at your feet. We bring our big worries about health and happiness, security for ourselves and for our loved ones, we bring our big worries about the world we live in and its future existence as we continue to fail to address the problems that we see around us, from war to the environment to the ways that we talk and gather and agree. We bring big worries about the way people in our world are treated as less than human. God, we know that you are concerned with every aspect of our lives, and so we also bring the little things that concern us, the worries that keep us awake at night, the worries which only you know. Living God, reach out to all of those for whom the future brings fear and uncertainty. Assure them that you are with them, even when that future seems dark and circumstances feel like they are spiraling out of control, remind them, remind us, that you are able to transform even the bleakest of situations. 
that you are able to bring healing and wholeness. Lord, we bring you these prayers for the ones that we love, who we name uh, in this space, even though we are separated. We make our prayers in faith, for we know that your spirit is at work in our world, making all things new. And so we pray the prayer that you taught us, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right, everyone. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for continuing to persevere and to be vigilant uh, in the midst of this pandemic. Thank you for for being safe and making wise decisions, for being healthy and for uh, caring for your neighbor in, in these ways. We'd love to invite you to join us on our Zoom call after the service. The link is right there in the, uh, in the chat bar, uh, or you can find it on your email. And all of these things, friends, go from this place, assured that Christ loves you more than you can possibly imagine. And so wrapped in that great love, live freely, serve lavishly, forgive abundantly. Go from this place to love and serve the Lord. Amen.